Welcome everyone in uh, the first video in a series talking about really the, the basics of exploitation and there's a number of concepts here that uh, certainly are then of course relevant to exploitation um, but also that you'll come across when doing reverse engineering in, in more of a general sense as well as malware analysis so I uh, hope you enjoy the series uh, we're going to start with the basic buffer overflow and so any sample programs that uh, I, that I use throughout these courses throughout these videos You'll find the source code here. Um, I'll likely start adding, I just thought of this as I, I started the recording here, uh, the binaries as well, because I've had a few folks report to me that even though they compiled the program using Visual Studio, that it doesn't create the same, uh, the same output in the binary. So that way you can follow along. But ideally, if you have the source code, you can use the, I'm using the latest version of Visual Studio compiler, the community edition. Uh, and so that should produce the same results um, as you see in these videos here as we do the analysis. So uh, add the link. You can just look for me on GitHub. Uh, Jay Stroch and Learning Reverse Engineering is the repository. Okay, so here's the sample program. You can see it's very basic and it is uh, really kind of the, the quintessential buffer overflow. Uh, we have, in this case, a buffer that's declared as a local buffer. So it's going to be a stack-based buffer. Um, I have a, a variable here, int a, and we're going to talk about this variable because there's going to be later videos we talk about, probably the next one we'll talk about stack cookies and some things that the compiler can do to help um, optimize some, some of the, the way that the stack is used for the local variables in this function. Um, so local variable or a local buffer, it's 10 bytes um, or 10 elements, it's each element is a byte. This will zero them out, so we'll see that once we disassemble the code. Really unnecessary for the purposes of the overflow, but I think when we, we'll look at this in a debugger, and that'll just make it a little bit clearer to see that memory cleared out. Um, and then the local variable. And then we have the stir copy, or the string copy. And what this stir copy is doing is this is actually creating the overflow, and that we're copying into, this is our destination, our local stack-based buffer, the argument that is passed to the program. And so if we pass an argument that's larger than 10 bytes, stir copy doesn't inherently, you can see there's no size check or limitation. And so it's just going to copy the bytes until it encounters a, a null byte. And into this buffer, because this buffer is on the stack, it will begin then to overwrite the contents of the stack. And if we can write far enough, we have the potential to modify other local variables depending on the layout. Um, and ultimately, if you were to try to, to take over or subvert the flow of execution, the execution flow, uh, then we would want to overwrite the return address, and that would be the ultimate thing. Now, this is an old technique. It's been around for quite some time. It became you know, sort of popularized in the late 90s with uh, smashing the stack for, I think, fun and profit by Aleph1. So you can look that up. It's a great reference. And uh, there are you know, a number of mitigations then that we'll kind of work through in this series to help better understand how modern compilers and modern you know, sort of software development process can help with this mitigation. So I'm not worried about any of that right now. We just want to focus on the basics here. Okay, to compile this, we will use the command line, so CL. Now, I do need to provide one flag. For the most part, um, a lot of these sample programs, I don't provide any additional command line or compiler options, but in this case we do, uh, the forward slash gs minus. And what that's going to do is that's going to remove what's called the stack cookie. So we'll talk about the stack cookie here uh, again, likely in the next video. So don't worry about that right now if you're not familiar with it. Just know that for these, for this demonstration, for this video, I'm disabling the stack cookies. Okay, uh, provide the source. This should now produce not our executable. So basic buffer overflow.exe. Okay, now we'll start our analysis in IDA. I'm using the free version of IDA, version 8.3, which was current as of the time of this recording. Um, and I've just changed the color scheme and then closed all of the default windows except for IDA view A, which gives us our disassembly listing and opened up the pseudocode view, which is now a part of the free versions. This gives us uh, the decompiler results. So we can look at both of these results here in order to analyze the program. Um, number of things that we can start with in our analysis. And the first thing that I wanna cover is just, you know, essentially mapping up the source code to what we're looking at here. And really the first thing to understand is, let's go back and look at this sample program. 
we have this statement that not only declares this 10 byte buffer on the stack, right? Because it's, it's defined within the scope of, of the main method, but it also zeroes out that memory. And so when we look at this in the disassembly here, uh, V4 bracket zero equals zero, V4 bracket one equals zero, V5 equals zero. What IDA has done is it doesn't recognize that that's all one singular array. And so it's allocated space on the stack via this var 10, var C, and var eight, and EAX was zeroed out. And that then value of that register, that zero values moved into that region of memory. So that's essentially what's zeroing out that memory. Okay, so we can think a little bit about how much space do we actually need in terms of local variables in the stack? Well, we have a 10 byte buffer, so that's 10 bytes, and then we have an integer variable, and that's four bytes. So that's 14 bytes that we need. When we look at the, the prologue here, and 10 hex was probably the default view, that's 16 bytes that it's allocating for stack space. So that's two more bytes than we initially calculated. So, so why is that? Well, if you think about or consider that the compiler will optimize um, the space used to, to, to be on four byte boundaries. And so for the first eight bytes of this, um, this local buffer, that's not a problem. Um, what it's doing though then is it's actually allocating another four bytes, but it's only using the you know two bytes of that four so that that way this next variable can be on a four byte alignment. And that's why we're seeing 16 bytes of total, of, of total stack space instead of just the 14 that's actually needed. So that changes our layout a little bit because now you know, in actuality, our buffer is a little bit larger than what we would have had in the source code. Now, when we're looking at a compiled program or we're reversing it, we're understanding the code, does it really matter? No, it doesn't. I mean, we can analyze the code. We can see that it is in fact only utilizing 10, you know, those 10 bytes. But when it comes to exploitation, if we were to overflow this buffer and take control of the program, we obviously have to account for that additional space. Okay, um, now we can double click any of these variables and this will give us a stack view. And so because of the way in which these variables were defined, let's take a look at this. We have the buffer and then we have the local. That's how they're laid out currently on the stack. So var 10 represents the beginning of that array. That's at the highest point of the stack. And as we write data to that array, then that data will go essentially down the stack and will eventually corrupt potentially these local variables var 4. This is the saved EBP. This is the return address. Of course, it can continue to write further depending on how large of an overflow. But if we wanted to, like in the classic sense of, an, of a buffer overflow, subvert the flow of the program, then we want to overwrite the return address because if we can control what goes there, then when this function returns, then it'll go to that location and not the original that was pushed on from what originally called it. Now we can clean this up a bit. So let's change this. I'm going to use the D key to toggle this from a D word to a byte. And then if we right click, we can define this as an array. This will bring up our convert to array dialog. And what we want to do, since we define that as a, as a byte, var 10 is a byte, our array element size is one, and the size of our array, we can say now is 12, right? 10 bytes for the actual buffer as it was defined in the source, but then these two bytes of pa essentially padding that we have in order to maintain stack alignment. Now, when you say okay, that'll convert. You'll get this warning about directly convert to array. Yes, we want to do that. And you'll see that it essentially overwrote any of those or those additional local variables. And I'm gonna take this, I guess, one step further, use the end shortcut key, and let's just call this our stack buffer. Okay, now if we switch back to Ida view, you can see that this moving into EAX, this looks a little bit more, it looks, it makes a little bit more sense because we have, you know, everything, these offsets relative then to be this beginning of this buffer for us. So these, these three moves, and then we have the initialization of that local variable. Uh, let's go back to the source code. So I called that int A. So we can call this uh, int A as well. Okay, if we click over here into the pseudocode view, you'll see this also has the benefit 
of changing this into a memset. So the decompiler then recognized that, oh, this is actually a memset. This is a buffer because we defined it as an array. This is what we're setting in that memory. And this is the size, 10 bytes, right? So that even actually helped clean up our decompiler view a little bit as well. Okay, what comes next? Well, this is our stir copy. So let's rename that. We know that because of the fact that we have the source code. If we didn't, we might have to do a little bit of further analysis. And we have our stack buffer, that's the destination, and our V, that's our source. So now we're gonna copy into that stack buffer whatever we pass on the command line. In order to do that, we need to switch to a debugger. And so really the, the what we need to take away from this as we move into a debug session is how much data do we need to send to the program in order to overwrite that return address? So for that, we can take a look at our, our stack view. So we know we need 12 bytes to fill the buffer, four more bytes to overwrite the local variable, right? And this is something to take in mind uh, or to keep in mind here that we might be able to influence the program in this case because we could overflow the buffer, modify this local variable, but not corrupt the rest of the stack. So the program could still return as it normally would based off of the, you know, the epilogue, uh, but we, we could modify this local variable. Um, so 12 bytes plus four, 16, we need four more, that's 20. So we need to send 20 bytes just to overwrite to the point where we've corrupted the saved EBP. And then those last four bytes will be the return address. So if we can put a valid memory address in here, then we can subvert the flow because this will get popped off the top of the stack. EIP will go to that location. If we just send nonsense, we'll get the program to crash. And that's usually the first step in just demonstrating that you have control of the program. Okay, so um, I guess in thinking about it, I'm gonna stop the video here uh, because this is enough analysis just to, to get us started. In the next video then we'll get into the dynamic analysis and then we'll get into the stack cookies and some further mitigations. So hope you'll join me in the next video and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, comments, please feel free to drop those in the comment section.